Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here for equipping hour, for enjoying each other as you fellowship together. Whoop. All right, not that. <coughs> All right, let me go ahead and pray, and I'll get us started. God, thank you so much for uh, a new day to be together as uh, the gathered people of God. What a joy it is to be together, to fellowship, to uh, encourage one another to stimulate one another to love and good deeds in the small ways that we're able to on Sunday mornings. It is a privilege to sit under your word once again, to uh, even proclaim your truth to your people who love you and are eager to be changed by your word. God, amidst all the concerns that might be on our hearts this morning. I pray you would help us to give attentive ears to your word and to your truth that is upheld. You've called your, your church to uphold your truth before a watching world. And God, as I, I pray as we talk one more time uh, in this equipping hour series about the duty and privilege of counseling that belongs to the local church, that you would use this uh, to further convince us of the superiority of the way you have ordained counseling to take place uh, among your people. God, I pray that we would be more resolved after having been together today to labor with you, to sanctify your people, to ourselves be sanctified and become better uh, better working members of the local church for the sake of your name ultimately and for the good of your people we know that you desire these things more than any of us ever could more than all of us put together and so we pray you would be so kind as to use us to these great and marvelous ends it's in your son's name that we pray these things. Amen. Go ahead and open your Bibles one more time to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28. Over the past, uh, I don't know how long it's been, a few years probably, just having to look again and again at this passage, needing to answer the question again for myself, what is the church called to do? Because there are so many opinions about what the church is called to do and the number of ideas about what the church should be about seems to only be increasing as time goes on. Looking at this passage again and again has been so helpful uh, to gain clarity on what the church is supposed to be about. And so as we talk again for the third time about counseling being the duty and privilege of the local church, I just want to read this passage again and get our eyes on Matthew 28, starting at verse 18. And when Jesus came up and spoke to them, and Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What a sweet promise from King Jesus to be with his church in a special way 
especially with his church, not as they take up whatever they think is profitable for the world to do, but specifically what he has commissioned them, what he has tasked them with accomplishing, and that is the discipleship of nations. Jesus promises his blessing, favorable presence with churches who make it their ambition to do that, to disciple nations. That has everything to do with counseling because that is essentially what counseling endeavors to do, is to see men and women and children discipled for the sake of the glory of King Jesus. As we've mentioned before, uh, biblical counseling, teaching Christians that the Bible is sufficient for counseling, that we don't need to go to a professional psychologist to deal with uh, troubles, common problems. Um, it's not necessary in order to deal with the personal and interpersonal problems of everyday life, to go seek out someone who doesn't know God, who claims to have expertise on the human psyche, the human soul, the mind. It's not necessary for the Christian to go seek out those means. Why? Because we have a sufficient counselor in God's word. Uh, God himself counsels his people specifically through his words. And as we made a recovery of that doctrine of the sufficiency of scripture, the, what has become the industry of biblical counseling has really expanded uh, into something that's been ex incredibly useful. Uh, churches like ours have benefited from the wealth of resources that have been developed, the number of teachers, men and women laboring in the field of biblical counseling. And so we're thankful for all the advancements that have uh, been made in our day to recover those doctrines. But as with any movement where good things are recovered, there are also pitfalls uh, that inevitably appear, uh, temptations to err and swing the pendulum too far in the right direction until it crosses what was the right direction and becomes an extreme and something that's uh, equally wrong. Uh, that's happened in biblical counseling, where the pendulum is swung and we have embraced or the church has embraced things that are actually hindrances to biblical counseling. As good and noble as biblical counseling is, there are things now that go under the label biblical counseling that are actually antithetical to what God intends. They're hindrances, uh, contrary to what God desires for his church, and they actually undermine what would other be, otherwise be sound biblical counsel. I want to put before you this morning six or five of those potential hindrances. You'll notice as we make our way through this list that these things aren't inherently uh, sinful as I discussed some of these things. You might recognize them in Grace Bible Church. And they're a part of the, the good inner workings of, of, of our ministry or outworking of the ministry that happens at Grace Bible Church. You might hear some of these things and think, I've been blessed by that. And that's absolutely appropriate and right. And so these things aren't inherently sinful. That's not what I'm seeking to draw our attention to, but things that are potential hindrances if they are not kept within the bounds of what is biblical. And so as we look at these five uh, 
potential hindrances, uh, really what I want to accomplish this morning is to help us be better guarded against these things in the life of our church. This will be helpful that we have these things on our radar to say, okay, that might be good, but it needs to be kept in its biblical proportions if it's going to remain a blessing to the church. That would be good for us. I want this morning to uh, convince you to pray harder, to labor more zealously for the continued strength of Grace, Grace Bible Church and whatever church churches that we plant in the future. We need to have our prayers and our labors set in that direction for continued strength so that we don't actually adopt any of these hindrances to good biblical counsel. And at the end of the day, we need to be convinced, utterly, thoroughly convinced of the superiority of what God has ordained. We cannot come up with a better way to disciple men and women than what God has put before us in his word. There is no person or organization or agency or curriculum or other resource that can come up with a superior way to counsel or disciple men and women than what God has just plainly laid out in his word. And so we need to be further convinced of that truth, and I think that this will be helpful to that end. Six potential hindrances to biblical counseling and, and biblical, biblical counseling. Uh, biblical, biblical counseling. I'm not trying to coin a new, new phrase with that, but biblical counseling is not always biblical. Just because the Bible is open does not mean that biblical counseling is taking place. The content of biblical counsel may be biblical, and yet if the context of biblical counseling is not biblical, then biblical counseling becomes unbiblical. The content and the context of biblical counseling must be biblical in order to truly be counseling God's way. And so this first potential hindrance to biblical counseling is what I'm calling professionalism in counseling. Professionalism in counseling. This would be counseling that externally is polished and has all the appearance of what looks like legitimate counsel. For example, what's a, a part of professionalism in counseling? Well, for starters, consider the terminology. You can have terminology that gives legitimacy to your counseling on the outside. Things like being called a counselor, that's biblical, the term counselor. You can call yourself a, a counselor, but what if someone thought of you as a counselor as that's my counselor, like you're a therapist, right? You're the person in their neatly categorized life to whom they go to solve their problem. They've got family, they've got friends, they've got pastors, they've got coaches or other circles of influence, and the person to whom they go when they have serious life issues is their counselor. And so they call you and you establish yourself as a counselor, so they, they see you as their personal therapist of sorts. Um, instead of, this would be in opposition to, you're their counselor instead of pastor, discipler, friend, 
right? There's nothing wrong with being a counselor, obviously. We've been encouraging you to be counselors. I hope you are a good counselor. But if you're a counselor instead of those other things, you're not really a friend, you're the counselor. You're not a pastor, you're the counselor. You're not uh, any of, of those biblical things, discipler, you're the, the counselor, the expert. That's, that gives an air of professionalism in counseling that's not actually helpful. Because when scripture, what scripture has in mind when it talks about counselors is those other things. A pastor, someone who's discipling you, a friend. What you don't want is, is people to have is the idea that this is a stranger with a set of skills and expertise that I dip in and out of when I need access to that skill and expertise. We don't need that kind of professionalism in counseling. Proverbs 27, 6, in a verse that de describes counsel that's actually helpful to challenge and sanctify and strengthen weaknesses, Proverbs 27, 6 says this, faithful are the wounds of a friend, profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Those wounds there are a reference to uh, difficult to hear counsel, a challenging word, a rebuke, an admonishment. It's a wound, a word that wounds, but it comes from a friend, right? You would consider those wounds not damaging, but faithful, useful, helpful in your life. And you welcome them, don't you, from your friends? Verse 9 in Proverbs 27 says, Oil and perfume make the heart glad, and the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. Good friends make the best counselors not the professional that you just met two hours ago and you're looking for real, deep, meaningful solutions to the most troubling problems in your life. You've uh, even heard me probably use the term counselee. Counselee, that's helpful just for context to understand what we're talking about, right? The person being counseled. But if uh, the counselee, again, is the counselee, the person being counseled, not friend, disciple, brother or sister in Christ, maybe even son or daughter in the faith, right? You see those terms being used biblically. Someone that you're, you're in their life, you see them regularly, they're... Uh, a part of your family, your family knows them. There's, there's really not a clean cut boundary between the counsel you do and the rest of your life. That's not off limits to them. Oh, okay, I can appreciate that kind of counseling if that's what that is. Someone who you're discipling, who's a friend, who's a part of the family of God with you, someone who is close enough to be considered your son or daughter in the faith, that's great. I love those kinds of counselees. But the I'm the counselor, you're the counselee, this is a one-way relationship, the rest of my life is off limits to you, that's the kind of professionalism in counseling that is actually a hindrance to biblical counsel because when the Bible talks about counsel, that's not at all what it has in mind. Another part of this professionalism in counseling is the, the very process that happens in the world of biblical counseling oftentimes. You think in the world of biblical counseling, there's a, a counseling center, and how do people find these counseling centers that are supposed to be bastions of wisdom and solutions to people's personal problems? Well, there's a referral 
oh, I, I saw a great counselor. You should see my counselor. And so there's a referral. This organization, this counseling center is often contacted and there's a request for counseling. And when the request for counseling is made by the person needing counsel, the organization sends that counselee, sends that person looking for help a, uh, a PDI, a personal data inventory, which is just some way of collecting data because we don't know who you are, we don't know where you're coming from, we don't know anything about your life, and so we want you to tell us about yourself and about your problems. We also want to know, do you have an advocate who can accompany you to counseling? And then after we've met with you for so many meetings, hopefully there's a, a plan in place, but after we've met with you and we feel like your problem solved, then we will graduate you from counseling. And then you go back to your regular life where you don't need counsel anymore, apparently. That's professional. That's, well, it has the semblance of what's supposed to happen in the world. Usually people who are in the world of psychology and counseling in the secular realm find themselves never finished counseling because their problem never really gets solved. And that's a, just a practical outworking of the, the broken system that they're a part of. But that's not at all what scripture, if you just read the Bible plainly, you would never get that idea that, oh, there's a process that people enter into for counseling and then they finish counseling eventually and go on their merry way and maybe when another problem comes back, they have to go back and see the counselor. That's professionalism, but it's not at all what scripture has in mind when it describes counseling. We move in and out very fluidly to needing counsel. My kid is not obeying this week. I need to check in with the Demarest or the Pagos to make sure I'm doing it right. <laughs> You're doing it right. All right, check. That's the counsel I needed. Uh, the, the people who counsel, who counsel more formally in this church, need counsel all the time on a variety of issues. And we call each other and we seek each other's help. Maybe uh, someone like Jeff Hantler is better at just his wheelhouse is uh, getting the most out of a budget. So I go to Jeff Hantler, who's our deacon over benevolence, and he's incredibly helpful, and I have, when that's the counsel I need. Other times, I'm being counseled by the men in my small group as they talk about what God's doing in their lives and what they're learning in the Word, and as they hear wrong thinking in my mind, and it's helpful. It's not a formalized process that way. Uh, our biblical counseling training ministry we actually have a, a process similar to this. Uh, when people hear, by virtue of uh, Tom and Ann's name, um, they have lots of relationships and people know, oh, they do counseling, so they get sought out or people seek out Grace Bible Church. We have a, on the window, on the front doors, free biblical counseling with a phone number and a website address, bcev.org. And so people contact us inquiring about our free biblical counseling or from the training that we've done across the valley, people wanna know or get sent to us, hey, they do counseling there. And if, we, if they're not in this church, then guess what we do? We send them a PDI, a personal data inventory. It asks for their testimony about themselves, what the problem is, if we don't know them. And so again, these, this isn't an inherently evil process, but even then the goal is to get them plugged into Grace Bible Church as soon as possible, right? That is an entryway into the life of this church. And frankly, men and women who are seeking help if we meet with them and they're not interested in being a part of this church, then we're convinced 
that God has called us, according to 1 Peter 5, to shepherd the flock among us and not the whole world. And so if someone's not interested in what we would call truly biblical counsel, remember from last week, that includes shepherd and care, that includes biblical fellowship, that includes corporate teaching and preaching, then you're actually not buying what we're selling. This is God's plan for biblical counseling. This is biblical, biblical counseling. To have all of those other elements a part of biblical counseling. People who are not interested in those other elements are not really wanting the help that we're seeking to provide. And since we're never at a loss in terms of the numbers of people to help, then we move on to the next person, graciously, <laughs> who's looking for the kind of help that's truly going to sanctify their life in a comprehensive way. It is a, a, a well-established um, axiom in, in the world of biblical counseling that involvement is needed uh, in John MacArthur and the faculty of the Masters University wrote a, uh, an introduction to biblical counseling called counsel, uh, biblical counseling, counseling, how to counsel biblically. And there's like eight eyes. I can never remember them. I don't know anyone who does remember all of the eight eyes, but there are eight eyes that are supposed to be sort of a guide to biblical counseling. One of those eyes is involvement. It's, it's a good biblical principle. Involvement. The counsele, counselor must get involved, must involve himself in the life of the person that he's counseling. How does that happen in this kind of professional environment in counseling? How does true involvement for me to, to cross over the professional boundaries, really step into your life, maybe that looks like me being in your home and actually watching the area of life where you are pinpointing a problem. Maybe it's me sitting in your home after your kids have gone to bed and counseling you and your wife. Maybe it's inviting you into my home so hopefully you can see what's hopefully a good model of uh, a loving marriage, biblical parenting. At some point, almost certainly, if you're there for a couple hours, I'm gonna be, dis uh, not, well, disciplining is a part of discipleship. I was gonna say discipling my kids. That's, that's a part of it, if you're a, a kid. I'm gonna be disciplining one of my kids before too long. And so hopefully that's a, a biblical example for you to observe, right? That, doesn't, that kind of involvement cannot happen in a professional environment. You're there for uh, 50 to 90 minutes, time's up, we'll have to pick up in two weeks or the next time we meet. You're the, the stranger with expertise who has office hours. <laughs> um, there's limitations on when the counselee can reach out to the counselor. Your counselor in a professional environment is not looking to answer the phone at midnight or two in the morning when a crisis happens. They're not coming over to your house, right? And so meetings have to be scheduled during work hours. Usually in this professional environment, this kind of involvement is limited to one-on-one -on -one interaction. There's uh, rarely another person being taught how to counsel while the actual counsel and discipleship is happening. That's a benefit when it's happening in a, in a local church. If you just know this is what we do, we're training up another generation of disciplers and it's helpful for another person to be watching as the counseling's happening. That's never gonna happen when there's a client-patient privilege, right? That's off limits. 
And again, this is that kind of professional relationship is much less like a friendship and more like a doctor client relationship. And the help is always one directional. We should be guarded against that kind of professionalism in counseling. That is not biblical counseling. That undermines biblical counseling in the long run. Number two, something else that is a potential pitfall, not inherently a pitfall, not a, an inherent hindrance, but a potential one is counseling centers. Counseling centers. What I have in mind here is parachurch outside the church centers that establish themselves as the place to go to get your biblical counseling. Now these happen in the biblical counseling world both inside and outside the local church. Some are attached to the local church and some are completely detached from the local church. So let me describe both for you. The one in the local church, this is a local church that has recognized the need to disciple men and women and praise God. That's a, a clear biblical mandate. Uh, the need is obvious that people in the church have problems. We all need help. We all need counsel. And so the church that establishes a counseling center would be the one who recognizes this pervasive need, and they are seeking to meet that need. There are men and women who are identified as counselors, who are identified as competent, to counsel, and so they're put on uh, full-time or part-time staff, or even perhaps a volunteer basis, and, the, and so that's their go-to ministry in the local church, and they receive counselees. They, they, they take in uh, people to counsel them as a part of full part-time work or volunteering and this is one that that happens inside the local church that has one set of potential hindrances and then the counseling center outside of the local church completely detached not under local church authority not accountable to a local church perhaps it's a husband and wife team perhaps it's a group of counselors who sort of brand themselves and they have a website and they become known for counseling people in the community, people from other churches, and they have some formal way of screening the people who work in that organization who get listed as counselors. That has uh, another set of weaknesses. Let me just point out some of the, the benefits to counseling centers generally. Here are some benefits. Uh, there's an organized structure for those seeking help. It's just a, a well-worn path usually that if you need help, here's the process. Boom, 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 boom. That can be helpful. That it's a, a well laid out structure if people are seeking for help. Um, another benefit is that it usually includes full-time staff. That's a, a huge benefit if you have people who are committed full-time to this sort of work. Obviously, that can be a benefit. Also, thirdly, public, public visibility is really helpful. A counseling center can uh, have a, a type of visibility if people have in their mind the professional model for counseling and they look online for a counselor, you're more likely to come up if you're a counseling center as opposed to just a church who does biblical counseling. And oftentimes along with that public visibility is that people actually are seeking that in our psychologized culture, people are looking for counsel in counselors, not in churches so much. If you think of uh, 
the amount of options there are. If somebody was looking for counsel from a church and they Google churches in the local er in the area, how many would come up? I don't know the difference between a Lutheran and a Methodist or a Presbyterian and a Baptist. And there are a plethora of options. I don't know which church to go to. And so if you're a counseling center and people are looking for those things, then the options can be fewer and you're more likely to find what you're looking for more quickly. Those are some benefits. By contrast, the hindrances of a counseling center, consider a counseling center in a local church, what usually happens in churches that establish counseling centers in the local church where men and women are doing all of the counseling is that all of the church's counseling is done by a small minority of its members. That's not helpful. Rather than what Paul was able to say to the Roman church in 1514, that he's encouraged about them brethren. The, the church generally, the, the brethren of the church, all the members were able to counsel one another because they were full of all goodness and filled with knowledge. That's a better plan for counseling is just to equip all the men and women to counsel as opposed to identifying a small minority as the counseling team. That's what we've chosen to do as a church is just to equip all the members as best as we can to be able to counsel. Now, obviously, perhaps a small minority uh, progresses in counseling, really excels in discipleship type ministry and practices, and it won't be hard to identify those men and women. It won't be difficult. They'll be the, the ones that you see growing personally, practicing the very things that are being taught, embodying those. You will find them often encouraging and pouring into the lives of others without being asked. And so those people end up being asked to do more. But without identifying them as the counselors, we have maintained and encouraged it to be the burden of all the body to do the counseling. When a small minority of people in the church is uh, identified as doing all the counseling, usually counseling is not then seen as discipleship. It's seen as a specialized practice for that small minority in the church. And so inevitably, the way the church thinks about what should be seen as discipleship is undermined. And so instead of thinking as, hey, that person has a problem, they just need discipling in their marriage or in their parenting or in the way they think about work, the way they think about involvement in the local church. Instead of just thinking as that person as needing discipleship and being willing to step into the life of that person in whose life I see the need, you should go, you should see the counselor. You should, you should go to the counseling center. That's tragic. People are usually in that context sent to the counseling center for help with everyday problems. And Christians are trained to think of counseling as something done by that small elite group within the church. And when that happens in any church where that is the case, when that happens, inevitably, the counseling team will be overwhelmed. Training other counselors will inevitably get sidelined. Counseling needs then have to go unmet because the counseling team is overwhelmed. And this will eventually force the corporate health of the church to decline. Those are some of the ramifications of a counseling center. That's even, and that's just within the church. 
Counseling centers who are autonomous outside of the local church, they cripple local churches in completely different ways. They do pastors, they're seeking to do pastor shepherding for them. When pastors say we don't deal with those problems, anxiety disorders, we don't deal with those problems. Go see a biblical counselor. Fear, parenting problems, go see a biblical counselor. There was a, a family who uh, I met with only a couple times, unfortunately. The presenting problem was their teenage son wanting to transition to being a female. This family uh, was in an, a very unfortunate position and they, their child was uh, forcing their hand, it was, it was manipulation, but threatening suicide if the parents didn't enable this, what the child was requesting. They didn't realize that the very predicament they had been in started a long time ago with bad parenting principles. And they had allotted a degree of freedom to the child at a young age, from a young age, that led to the very problems they were experiencing then. Um, they had a hard decision in front of them, and they acknowledged that it would be sin to give in to the whims of their child, and yet, at the end of the day, they loved that child more than they loved obedience to the Lord. Uh, it, is, it is a good principle, and Jesus says this in Matthew 10. Anyone who loves son or daughter, father or mother, more than me is not worthy of being my disciple. Uh, the, a disciple of Jesus must be more committed to obedience and allegiance to Jesus than life itself, their own or anyone else's. Um, it's unfortunate that a, a couple like that was not getting biblical counsel from their pastors. A local church in, in the valley. Um, because they weren't being discipled well in parenting, that led to other problems for which they continued to seek counsel outside of the local church. And there was a, a local counseling agency I was a part of, willing to counsel them. In the long run, that cripples uh, the effectiveness of local churches when it allows pastors to abdicate their shepherding responsibilities. The best counsel that people, Christians in those churches could get is to find a biblical church that's going to counsel them. If your church isn't equipped, are they trying to be equipped? If your pastor doesn't know how to deal with the problems that you have, is he willing to sit in with the biblical counselor you're going to go see to learn how to deal with these problems the next time they come up? And if he's unwilling, then the best thing you could do is to get out from under his shepherding. That's not unkind, that's God's plan. Another potential hindrance in counseling Number three is charging for counseling. Charging for counseling. This is not what Jay Adams intended when he began teaching the church about his duty to counsel biblically. That people would turn it into a full-time industry outside of the local church, a full-time job outside of the local church, and charge people seeking help on a per session basis. Well, that's not only not what Jay Adams intended, that's not what God intended. As we've already seen, this is discipleship. This is the ministry of the local church. And so this is one friend helping another, one mature Christian coming alongside another. 
What if you thought about discipleship that way? You need discipling? I'll disciple you for the low price of $150 per married couple or $75 per individual. Or if you need family counseling, I'll disciple your family for a little bit more than that. That's not what God intended, right? When counseling becomes a specialized field, well, charging is, is actually not only permissible, it's expected. And there is money to be made. As long as there are people with problems who are seeking a biblical solution, then there's money to be made in biblical counseling. Is it evil to be charged? Is it inherently sinful? I'm not sure I would go that far. But it's certainly not what, what God intends for the local church. Some reasons that are given for this practice in the biblical counseling world are that people expect to pay for counseling. Uh, you paid for a degree in counseling. You should be compensated for your training. It's not wrong to be paid for your time. We have overhead to cover if you're a counseling center outside of the local church, so we need to cover our overhead, so that's why we charge for counseling. Charging people for counseling helps with buy-in from the counselee. If they're, if they're paying for it, then they'll have greater buy-in. That's not true, actually. People still don't do the homework. <laughs> and what's necessary to change. Or that charging shows that we provide professional level, level expertise. Perhaps that's true. That doesn't make it helpful. Charging for counseling removes counseling from the common one another practices that God intends counseling to be, just discipleship ministry. It formalizes counseling in an unhelpful way. Every time somebody's receiving counsel from you, they have to pay for it. Do I text my counsel, counselor? Is, that, is he gonna charge me for that? Is that okay? Uh, charging for counseling puts counseling in the realm of professionalism, that it's inescapable at that point. Whether you do it in the church or outside the church, it is inescapable. The, the idea that counseling is done by the professionals. I wouldn't pay my friend for counsel. I wouldn't pay my parent for counsel or my child for counseling, for help with a problem. So as soon as you pay somebody else for counseling, automatically it's, it's a, a professional endeavor. It's a professional transaction. You can't escape professionalism so long as you're charging, despite how bi biblical your counseling is. And you can't escape the fact, the, the air of um, expertise that this is done by an expert. Because again, you wouldn't pay someone who's not an expert, who doesn't have the training to counsel you for their counsel. One other uh, pitfall that I haven't heard much, unfortunately, about, uh, about this pitfall, uh, pastors, um, even deacons are warned biblically about uh, loving money, about pursuing uh, unjust gain. Think about the connection that a financial transaction makes between the counselor and the person receiving counsel. The, when money is exchanged on a session-by-session -session basis, that introduces a temptation that's not good for anybody's heart. If I solve this person's problem in one session, my means of gain is gone overnight. 
if I solve this person's problem in a, in a quick way, my means of gain is gone. Um, if I tell the person coming to me who's willing to pay me for my counsel that I can't keep counseling you if you're going to stay under the unbiblical teaching that you're in, that you're staying under, my means of gain is gone. It introduces an impediment to saying the hard things to the person that needs to hear it. If my livelihood is dependent on saying those hard things, on, on keeping the counselee who needs to hear the hard things said, that's not good for the human heart. If your livelihood is, is uh, founded on a case-by-case -case basis with counseling, that just introduces complexities and temptations and uh, hindrances to the heart of the counselor, not to even mention the counselee. And not to mention it makes help. <laughs> this poor person who needs help, it often makes the help given predicated on their means, financial means. If I can't pay $150 a session to save my marriage, what else am I supposed to do? My marriage needs help. Maybe I'm willing to go into debt to pay this biblical counselor. That would be tragic. You become a slave to a, a lender to save your marriage for the sake of biblical counseling. And that's not to say that biblical counselors are greedily wondering how they can make a dollar. I don't know anybody who's receiving uh, payment for counsel who's actually doing that. I think the men and women sincerely desire to help. Nevertheless, those are temptations still. And then again, if someone's livelihood is based on uh, counseling other people's sheep, shepherding other people's sheep, I don't mind crippling the church. I don't even, I'm not even motivated at that point to think deeply about how I might be crippling the church because I'm well provided for on, by doing someone else's job. If it's pastors willing to send referrals. I, when I was working with a, a, a local counseling organization, I, was meet, I met with a, a young man who his pastor didn't, there's multiple reasons that this pastor hadn't preached the gospel. I ended up reaching out to the pastor because this person clearly didn't know the gospel. And I wanted to know from the pastor what the involvement was like, what are you doing with this young man? The pastor was convinced that this young man was a Christian because he was baptized at birth in the Catholic Church. And the pastor believed in baptismal regeneration. This was from a church that was consistently sending referrals to this particular counseling organization. And they were happy to receive the referrals because it was a means of consistently having counselees and of monetary gain. The biblical counseling in that instance was hindered uh, tremendously for the sake of maintaining a name, a reputation, a steady stream of people to counsel. That's not helpful. Number four, extra biblical resources in counseling can also be a potential hindrance. You walk outside, we have lots of extra biblical resources on the book table, uh, bookshelves. Extra biblical resources are a hindrance to biblical counsel when a few things happen, when they become a replacement for scripture itself Scripture is clearer than every single book on those bookshelves for all of the problems that we're dealing with in biblical counseling. Scripture is clearer, it's more authoritative, it's better than any extra biblical resource. Oftentimes, biblical counselors are more familiar with extra biblical resources than scripture itself. 
I'll give you two examples. I happened to be counseling a man who, after several meetings in the course of conversation, revealed that another counselor in the same biblical counseling agency was counseling this man's wife, and they were unreconciled. They weren't even living together. And I thought, why aren't we sitting down together with you and working on reconciling you? I called the biblical counselor, let's get together. We schedule a meeting, the four of us get together, the woman that she's counseling, the guy that I'm counseling, and we just start to, to lay the groundwork for some very uh, clear biblical instruction. Well, when I asked all of us to open up to Ecclesiastes chapter 12, the other biblical counselor had no Bible. So she gets up from the table, walks over to the desk in the office area that we're at, gets a Bible, and then sits back down and can't find Ecclesiastes. But she had been recommending all kinds of biblical resources in her counsel with this woman. It was at that moment I realized I'm the only biblical counselor in the room. I'm a part of biblical counseling groups on social media. And it's interesting as counselors look for help with specific cases that they're dealing with, inevitably read this book, this curriculum, go listen at this series. Those things aren't bad. I love curriculums, I've used them. I love extra biblical resources, I use them. What about just having them go to this passage and have you visited this passage with them? Have you articulated this principle for them? Counseling is not done just because a person read a book on that, right? Oftentimes in biblical counseling, we can get that sense. Have they read that book? Their problem should be solved. Extra biblical resources are no replacement for the one another ministry of the local church or actual shepherding care. God has given the church teachers. Local churches have teachers for that reason. And then finally, training certifications and academic degrees, number five. Those things, as helpful as they can be, they increase the number of counseling resources, they improve the competency of counsel. Biblical counseling is made more readily available as greater training is offered, um, more specialized certifications perhaps. Um, Tom and I are both certified association of certified biblical counselor, counselors, ACBC counselors and possess certifications with that organization. Those aren't inherently wrong. But again, when it's assumed that a, comp uh, a counselor is competent just because he has some certification, like the situation I just mentioned, that's unhelpful. Just because you've taken 35 hours on biblical counseling does not mean that you are a biblical counselor or competent to counsel. Romans 15, 14 is you have to be full of goodness and filled with knowledge and you're competent to counsel. If you're not living it and if you don't understand the problem biblically, then you're not, a, you're not competent to counsel in that instance. We should be guarded from these things um, I pray that we will be, and as we continue to disciple men and women for the sake of discipling others, uh, we should be more resolved uh, to believe that the local church, not outside agencies, are really God's very best plan for discipling and counseling God's people. God, thank you so much for uh, these truths. Your, your word is so clear and your plan is so wise. And we should just stand in awe that you have entrusted us with this tremendous privilege to use your sufficient word to counsel one another. And I pray that Grace Bible Church would have a clearer vision than ever and be more committed than ever to do this.
here, as we plant churches locally across the valley, that we would remain committed to this, and even other places in the United States, around the world, that we would excel still more in this biblical practice. And we pray that you would, by your grace, protect us from these poten potential hindrances to counseling the way you would have us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.